All right, so today we're gonna to go over a bunch of epoxy sort of mishaps and mistakes and cover all their solutions that we use in our shop. We recently did an Instagram post and we asked people to share their big epoxy mistakes and my videographer, Eric, he printed out a whole bunch of them and I'm gonna kind of pick through these one by one and talk about how we solve these problems in our shop. By the end of this, you should be an epoxy expert in not making the same mistakes that these people made that cost them thousands of dollars. All right, so let's just pick one and we'll start reading and I'll explain how we deal with it in our shop. Go with this one. We got Brian Grant 29. He said, don't do it outside in the sun. He decided to move his piece outside of the garage. Once the pour was done, it caused so many bubbles and it was like a magnifying glass in the sunlight. So what happened was brought his piece outside, the sun hit it, and that additional heat from the sun caused it to cure faster and bubble and heat up faster than it should have. So kind of covers, you know, shop temp as, you know, an important detail to make sure that you're covering and don't do it outside in the sun. A. Carlton said, I didn't use enough pigment and it turned out more tinted and see-through than a solid color. One thing you'll notice when you're mixing epoxy in the pail is, you know, if you have a, a huge container of epoxy, it looks very opaque and dark. It's hard to judge what the real color is because when you pour it out at, you know, one inch thickness or inch and a half or two inch thickness, it gets a lot lighter. So one thing we deal with that is we use a popsicle stick. So we'll use a popsicle stick and in our mixing container, we'll just put it in on a 45 degree angle at the depth that we're pouring. So if we were pouring a two inch, we'll put this in two inches and see what it looks like at the bottom. And that will give you an idea of how opaque or translucent your epoxy is. You can also use like a small clear shot glass and just dip it in and hold it up and that'll give you an idea of that translucency. One thing I always try to remember is you can always add more pigment, but you can't take pigment out. So start small, add a bit more, add a bit more until you're happy with it. Measure it with the stick, double check because when you pour it out, it's gonna be a little you know, a little more translucent than what it looks like in the pail. All right, let's do this one. So SKO Remodeling said, I made my first frame out of flimsy HDP plastic and it didn't support the bottom. So when I poured, I ended up with a belly on one side. What they're saying is their form was made out of a weak bottom. So maybe like quarter inch HDP or quarter inch plywood. It was probably blocked up on a few blocks or horses. And it's fine when it's, the slabs are resting in there and there's no epoxy. But when you add epoxy, it creates a bit of a belly in the bottom of the form and you end up wasting a lot of epoxy that you just need to sand or plane off later. So what we do is we'll use thicker sort of HDPE or plywood if we're building a form, but I'll show you an example. So here's an example of the thickness of HDPE that we use. We use three quarter inch. This is just the divider, but it gives you an idea. Uh, three quarter inch so that, you know, it doesn't have a lot of flex in it, especially if you're sitting flat on a table and your table's level and flat to begin with. If you are building a form out of thin material, make sure it's on a flat solid surface, kind of like this table. You know, we use a lot of pre-made HDP forms and they're fine as long as you have a solid bottom that you're working off of. You don't want to span those across a set of, you know, saw horses or up on blocks on a table. So Mike Leader said, I ordered two inch deep epoxy for a three and a half inch table. I had to do it in two pours. Looks like he's saying that he sanded too fine before applying the top coat. So between your two pours, you don't wanna pour, let it cure and then pour again because that second pour won't adhere to the first pour. So how you solve that is by scuffing up the entire surface, which at first glance, it looks like you're ruining the whole piece because it gets all scuffed and scratched and you think it's never gonna you know, disappear. But once you do that second pour on top of all the scuffs, you'll be amazed at how those scuffs just disappear. So I'll show you what we use. We just use a coarse sanding block like this. And you know, if our river was right here, we'll just kind of give it a nice big scuff along the entire surface. We'll even scuff up the sides of the walls if epoxy got on our walls while we were doing that first base pour. If you don't do that, you risk the two epoxy layers separating because it's a weak point without the extra surface area that all the scratches kind of provide. Leaf it to the bark, underscore CWC. Thought I had the entire form sealed. Came back to it five minutes later on a hunch and half my epoxy was on the shop floor. Luckily, I had a bunch of silicone on standby and was able to plug all the leaks before losing everything. Hard lesson learned. Yeah, you definitely want to 
kind of maintain and babysit the pour for at least an hour after you do the pour. So you never want to pour and then just go up to go to sleep or leave your shop. Hang out for another hour, if, you know, half an hour minimum to make sure that if there is a leak, you can address it before coming into all your epoxy gone. You know, better to save half of it or three quarters of it versus 100% of it just leaking out onto the floor. So what we do is we'll keep, uh, you know, an extra silicone gun around, maybe even a hot glue gun, which let me show you what we use. So normally a combination of silicone with a, the automatic one makes it nice and easy because you're not fighting with it, fighting with it to try to get going, but you use what you have. And then hot glue. The hot glue cures nice and quick, a little bit quicker than that. And it's a little more rigid once you, well, once you get it out of the gun and it starts to cure. There's no perfect solution to this. It's just kind of like a salvage mode at that point. And you just use a combination of what you got. Sometimes even to slow it down, we'll put some paper towels in it to just slow it down to absorb it and then remove the paper towels and then run a bead of hot glue or silicone just to slow that thing down and, and not have it you know, flowing everywhere and trying to apply silicone to a, a leak that's already out of the form. Okay, so olive tree woodworking. He said that he used wood that was sold as kiln dried and he took their word for it. It warped even with C channel every 16 inches. It was an absolute nightmare. Luckily it was our personal table and not a client. So you're gonna wanna make sure that you're buying wood from sort of reputable sources. If you're buying wood on Kijiji or Craigslist or any other randoms on the internet. You're gonna to wanna to have a moisture reader. You're gonna to wanna to double check that because if the wood still has moisture in it, as it dries, it shrinks and it will pull away from the epoxy. Yeah, definitely either buy from a reputable source. You should double check it anyways, but I mean, it's not a common practice for us because we've been buying from the source for seven or eight years. So we've kind of built a relationship and we know what to expect. But if you're buying wood from a first time new supplier, definitely bring a moisture reader, make sure it's good to go. All right, so this is Mac cutting boards. A mistake, question mark, several. Not sealing the mold and watching all the resin pour out onto my floor. So that's kind of a previous mistake. Not using the correct mix and having it hard as a rock before I poured it. Could go on and on. So I guess there's a few other mistakes in the mix. I guess the, the point we'll touch on here is mixing the resin properly. Always double check the two to one ratio, one to one ratio. Whatever the brand is that you're using may have a different ratio, but that's important to double, triple check. We use a scale. You could use those volume containers as well. Think of it like this. It's a, it's a scientific mixture. And if you're off by say more than, I don't know, 5%, it's either gonna not cure or cure too fast and too hard, which either way results in a failed project. So yeah, definitely either having a scale or those containers or both on hand is gonna be super valuable. There's tons of articles on the internet and YouTube videos where you can learn how to properly measure and whatnot. And just to be clear, we've made the same mistakes. So, you know, you practice and you have good habits. It's, we're all human, so we all, you know, make the odd mistake, but you know, if you can eliminate it as many times as possible and double check your work. That's a good practice to get into. AD Russell 924. Probably a stupid question, but I have not done my first table yet. I see people talking about sealing their wood pieces first. What do you use for that or what do you recommend? After you take the bark off and you clean up that edge, some people will apply epoxy to the two live edges in the river. Now, that's not something that we do. Some people do do it. And the way to do it properly is you either brush that edge entirely with epoxy let it cure and then scuff that edge up with the sandpaper, as I mentioned earlier, or do your brush coat and pour before that cures so that that brush coat can become one with the main pour so that you're not letting that cure and then having a new pour that needs to try to attach. It all kind of becomes one, but that brush coat will remove some of the bubbles or rather air that creates the bubbles in the epoxy. Most of the time we don't bother because we use a slower curing epoxy, which you know, allows those bubbles to release and come to the top. And if you're doing opaque pores, the odd bubble in there won't be that noticeable. This is kind of more critical on clear pores. If we were doing a clear pour in our shop, definitely brush the edge and then just pour soon after. Or if you can't pour soon after before it cures, make sure you scuff the edge. Okay, so Counting Crafts said, no tuck tape or mold release on an eight foot table. Was on a sheet of melamine but had to basically power plane the entire board off and the laughing crying emoji. What they did was build the entire form out of melamine or some sort of wood. They didn't apply tuck tape or something to have that cured epoxy release. So basically they epoxied their entire table to that form material that they used. Yeah, if you're gonna use melamine, I would still do tuck tape on it. That's kind of best practices. I've seen some people do mold release, but 
I don't know, to me that's too risky if you're pouring thousands of dollars of epoxy and you know a couple slabs of wood. So on smaller projects, the way we solve this is we use a pre-made mold, which I'll show you. So this is an 18 inch round pre-made mold. The cured epoxy doesn't stick to it, so you don't have to do a mold release. You can if you want, but it's not 100% necessary. And when the piece is all cured, you simply pop the sides, flip it over, and tap the bottom or hit the bottom, and your piece pops right out and you're ready to pour again. Now, a form out of melamine, you're gonna want to clad it in sheathing tape or tuck tape. You could still use the mold release if you want, but you definitely don't want to just build a wood form or use any other materials. Epoxy sticks to just about everything. Using tuck tape or a pre-made mold or build your mold out of HDPE and you'll be able to pour and release the walls of your mold without it getting stuck to your table. All right, let's go with this one. All day weird, mostly just from not mixing it thoroughly. Every molecular part of Part A needs a molecular part of part B. Having pockets of A and pockets of B anywhere in the mix doesn't cure. Another early mistake was trying to cure it in an environment with way too much humidity. When you mix your part A and B together, if you just, you know, half ass mix it for 30 seconds or a minute, there's gonna be pockets of part A and pockets of part B that will never cure because they need to be in contact with each other and thoroughly mix. Think about like if you pour milk into a coffee and you know it's kind of swirling around but it doesn't fully mix until you mix it. That'll give you a visual idea of how much you have to mix it. Obviously a lot more with epoxy because it's thicker but if you don't mix it they're always kind of separate and they slowly mix but not the best. So what we use is a paddle mixer. We use a paddle mixer there's smaller versions of this. We just use it, we use it around all the edges of the bucket. You wanna make sure that you're thoroughly mixing. One thing to remember is you can't over mix epoxy, but you can under mix epoxy. So if you're not quite sure if you've mixed enough, keep going. Wait until you know the mixtures are fully mixed and you know you've gotten it 100% well done. Okay, Fireside Lumber. I actually recognize them, I think they're a customer of ours. My first pour, I used a huge maple slab with a knot in the middle that I had dug out. I was excited to make a coffee table for myself. I used duct tape to seal, not knowing anything about epoxy. Did the pour, felt pretty good about it, grabbed myself a coffee, came back and all the epoxy was on the floor. So let me show you what he's referring to. I think I have a slab. So what he's referring to is when you have a slab like this with a void that goes all the way through is you know, he just put, it says duct tape. I don't know if he meant duct tape, but either way, he put tape on the bottom to pour from the top. And he probably just did one strip of tape, not enough to really hold it in place. So we poured it, which it'll hold for, you know, a minute or two or a few minutes, but the tape is gonna release, the epoxy is gonna leak out, and then your epoxy will be shy of the surface or fully leak out the bottom. So what we would do is take a slab, if this was our top, we would take tape and we'll do you know, one band across the, the knot or the void. And then we'll do a few this way and then add another one or two. So it looks like a, you know, quite a bit larger than the void itself. Then what we'll actually do is clamp it to a work surface. So if this was our work table, we'll just clamp the board down or you could clamp another piece of plywood or something flat to the underside. The tape has nowhere to go. Even if the epoxy starts separating it from the board, it'll still maintain its position against the board and prevent that sort of belly bubble on the bottom. Make sure you use a little bit of extra tape and make sure your piece is held flat against another surface. That will definitely keep it from creating that big void in the bottom. I am Astrid Ellis. They said, I overheated the epoxy while torching bubbles. The wood released a lot more air than expected. Had to learn that if covering wood, build up the layers so the air can rise and find its way out before the last layer that covers the wood completely. So basically what they're saying is, all the little air bubbles that rose to the top of their epoxy, they used a heat gun, which got one here. They used a heat gun to, you know, go over top and all those bubbles pop, which makes it look awesome. But the challenge is they probably focused their heat gun for too long in one area or the, the entire piece and they thought they needed way more heat than what they actually need. Next time you pour epoxy, do a little experiment and just try blowing on it with your mouth. You'll Notice that just the hot air from your breath will actually pop some of the smaller bubbles. You just need a light pass and you don't want to stay in one area focused too long or else what you're doing is you're putting extra heat into the epoxy which causes it to cure faster and you almost never want the epoxy to cure faster 
especially if you're using an outside source of heat. With a heat gun, take your time. Oftentimes those bubbles are sitting on the very top and they'll pop anyways, but if you wanna use a heat gun, give it a light pass. Don't focus on any area too long. Just go easy on it. You can always come back for a second pass if you left some behind. Here's back to getting your mixture correct. A fig said, I screwed up and put too much hardener in a pour, basically exploded. Sounds interesting, but yeah. Measure twice, pour once. See Wiley 429, not mixing the two to one ratio correctly. And one time using jewelry casting epoxy for a deep pour. That's actually another valid point of use the right epoxy for the right application. If you're using a tabletop epoxy, don't pour it at inch and a half. That will heat up way too fast. It'll crack, bubble, overheat, and ruin the whole project. Leave the tabletop epoxy for tabletops. Yeah, he said, I almost burnt the shop down. So it's not a laughing matter. It's, it's a serious matter to use the correct epoxy. Michael Bittical said, I had my first bad pour a few weeks ago. Thankfully, it was only a set of coasters. The epoxy I was using was a two to one ratio. For some unknown reason, I mixed it one to one. I tried to add more resin and mix it in the mold. It didn't work out so well. At least it only cost me a few dollars. So you know, even on a small project, you may not be thinking too much because it's first nature to mix your epoxy together. But you know, big or small, take your time, don't rush it, get that two to one or one to one mixture correctly of the correct application epoxy. Don't use the tabletop on a deep pour and vice versa. Probably one of the most common mistakes. I just read the first line there, make sure the temperature. So shop temperature is a huge challenge, especially if you're working in your garage or your workshop's not heated or cooled. So our shop here, we have heat, which is good for the winter. It helps solve that problem. But in the summer, we don't have AC. So we have to rely a little more heavily on, you know, fans or leaving the door open to the office where there is AC. You just have a bit of that cool ambient air coming. It was too cold and the two parts didn't mix and it separated again, obviously not curing properly. Here's another example from Crosscut Artistry. I poured 12 gallons, my first big river table. It was in my garage without air conditioning or a fan and it was 90 degrees out. Went back to check on it 20 minutes later to find smoke billowing out of the garage and I thought the table was gonna light on fire. It's not just a suggestion. This is like very good practice to not one, burn your garage down or two, ruin your entire project. Here's another example from Monkey Biz Creations. Yep, I did an 80 liter pour and was so excited I forgot to turn my fans on. Ended up with a huge separation crack right in the middle. So what happened was did his pour, no fan on there. And as it cured too fast, it ended up cracking, which sometimes that's salvageable, sometimes it's not. And then you have a whole new sort of set of problems on your hands. Colorful Council said, yep, I tried mixing epoxy when it was too cold, ended up with a very sticky goop. Then I was able to get another attempt done, but the form wasn't stable enough and there was some leakage. Then the table got stolen. <laughs> so that's, we can't really help with, <laughs> with that last problem, but uh, too cold of a shop, if you're mixing epoxy, just like too much heat is a bad thing, too cold is a bad thing. If it's, if your shop temp is too low, the epoxy actually doesn't get warm enough to cure and you end up with it just kind of remaining in a gel-like state or still soft enough you can push your nail into it, which isn't hard enough, obviously. And then you had the form issue and then somebody stole it. So that one's, <laughs> I don't know what else to say about that, but a couple of uh, pointers we can definitely add to that one. We've got Wood Sedge YEG. He said, I committed the same three mistakes that you've listed, which in the post, I listed the three mistakes that we had made in the past to hopefully teach people to learn. They tried to learn from all three. Number three, I'm still working on as I like to keep the bark on my pieces. I've learned that certain pieces lend themselves well to preserving the bark. And so far, fingers crossed, it's worked for me. So it sounds like the main issue is, is keeping bark on the piece and it's splitting away, which we actually have a piece. Let me grab it. So I actually just noticed this when we came in. This was made by a high school co-op student. I think it was about six months ago. And I guess we didn't teach him everything he needed to know. What happened was the epoxy split from the live edge piece. And you can see here, there's actually quite a bit of bark still on the piece. And the epoxy that's attached to the bark is what split. So, I mean, we might as well just try to snap this off and we can see inside you can see here, it's all just like the, sort of like that little skin that's between the bark and the sapwood on a piece of wood that the epoxy was attached to. And it wasn't actually attached to the wood grain of the wood, which is where you get that absorption of epoxy and you get a firmer bond. Likely the rest of this piece will chip away because of that sort of skin layer on the actual live edge cookie here. There's an example. And if you're selling products to a customer for, you know, a couple hundred bucks or 
whatever the price is. If this happens to them, you're gonna get a phone call, you're gonna have to remake a piece, send it out, all because this wasn't removed fully. So what we'll do is we'll just, we'll sand that edge entirely, wait till you have only sapwood left. I've seen some people actually drill holes into the edge grain just for that extra reassurance, especially on a pigmented pour, you're not gonna see that. Even on a clear pour, you could do the odd one in precarious spots where you're not gonna uh, really notice it. Yeah, that's that. Last but not least, the videographer said to save this one for last, so I don't know why, but we'll read it and we'll find out. It's the long one. One KD Cali. First time I ever worked with epoxy, I didn't have my form tightened enough as I began to pour it on the counter. I could see it was leaking, so could my husband. He did say I didn't think it was tight enough, but I wanted to do it on my own. As the epoxy was pouring out of the form, I was frantically trying to mop it up with as many paper towels as I could grab. All the while, I'm still denying that it's leaking. In desperation, I grabbed a large bin, pushed the whole thing into it, so the whole project was scrapped. It was ruined. That experience taught me a lot of things. One lesson was that if you're gonna get good at something, you need to leave your ego behind. I couldn't agree more. A lot of people think, oh, I've made this, I've done that, I've done 10 pours. Even if you've done this a thousand times over, Mistakes can still be made. You still gotta you know, prepare for the pour properly and take your time and plan ahead. Don't let your ego get in the way. Um, we've done hundreds of pours and we still make the odd mistake because we're all human. So yeah, I like that one. I'm glad you saved that one for last. Not to get too far ahead of yourself. Don't think, you know, I've done this before and I'm a professional. Like there's always something to be learned, especially from all these mistakes that we just learned from other people who weren't on their first project. They might've been on their 10th or 15th, but they still, uh, still are making mistakes and will all probably continue. But if we can eliminate those one by one, that'll make for a more profitable and sort of happy business and ultimately happier customers. Thank you guys for watching. If you made it this far, drop us a comment. Let us know if you've made any epoxy mistakes before so that maybe someone else can learn from them. We'll definitely be dropping more mistakes that we make in the comments and responding to other comments of how we fix those mistakes if we didn't cover it here. If you got any value from this, leave us a like and hopefully we can create more content like this to bring you more value and improve your projects as a whole.